A very good evening and a warm welcome to the Business Roundup on our television. We are ready to bring you the key developments in the business arena for the gone week. I'm Ashing Sanivir Singh. Let's move on to today's headlines. <music> Government plans to develop Kankasanthure port into a main commercial port in Sri Lanka. New government seeks permission from the parliament to go for a new supplementary budget to settle areas incurred by the good governance regime. Production of tea during the last year drops by 1.25% compared to 2018. News in detail. Co-Cabinet spokesman Minister Dr. Ramesh Patrana says the cabinet nod was given to acquire 50 acres land for the Sri Lanka Ports Authority in order to develop the Kankasanthure port into a main commercial port in Sri Lanka. Minister Patrana announced this and key other cabinet decisions that were taken last Wednesday addressing the weekly cabinet press briefing held at the Government Information Department last Thursday, which was also attended by the cabinet co-spokesman Minister Dr. Bandula Gunawadana. Minister Dr. Ramesh Patrana added that relevant cabinet proposal on the development of the Kankasanthure port was tabled at the cabinet meeting by the Roads and Highways, Ports and Shipping Minister Johnston Fernando. 15-acre state-owned land adjoining to the Kankasanthure port will be acquired and another 35-acre private property will be taken for the development of the port after paying a compensation amount. This initiative will ease the transportation of goods across north and south of the country, Minister further added. On the other hand, Minister Patrona added that the cabinet approval was given to issue medical certificates through 150 government hospitals for those obtaining driving licenses and renewing light vehicle licenses. Earlier medical certificates were only issued through the Motor Traffic Department's medical office, creating immense hassle to the general mass. Addressing the parliament last Wednesday, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa, as the finance minister of the country, listed out the areas incurred during the previous government in relation to key services and projects. Meanwhile, against this backdrop, Cabinet approved a proposal to present a resolution to vote on account parliament to settle the areas incurred during the last regime. The parliament was convened for the first time in this month and Speaker Karujai Surya tabled all the annexes and exhibits of the Central Bank Bonds Camp Forensic Audit Report. The annexes and exhibits were submitted to parliament by the Central Bank. The Speaker also added that CD copies of the annexes and exhibits will be placed in the parliament library, while a printed version will also be made available to the parliamentarians. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajpaksha, who chairs the Finance Ministry, criticised the former government on the arrears incurred during its administration pertaining to services and projects. Premier Rajpaksha highlighted that the previous government had already used the money allocated by the vote on account by November last year and that the new government could not pay the payments due for December. Finance Minister added that former government has not paid 1,188 million rupee arrears, which was borne by the election commission pertaining to the presidential election last year. Former government had not paid about more than 25,000 million rupees in relation to the supply of medicine and other related services at the health ministry. An arrears of 23,900 million rupees on the agriculture subsidiary program is still pending, the Premier noted. Moreover, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajpaksha added that an amount of accounting to more than 18,400 million rupees to be paid to the transportation and highway sector is still pending. Thus, in this backdrop to pay off series of arrears, the Premier proposed that government should go for a supplementary budget of 55 billion rupees. Meanwhile, opposition leader Sajid Premadasa proposed the Leader of the House for a debate on this issue. Headline inflation as measured by the year-on-year -year change in the Colombo Consumer Price Index increased to 5.4% in January 2020 from 4.8% in December 2019. This was driven by monthly increase of prices of items in both food and non-food categories. Central Bank of Sri Lanka releasing its latest data said that food inflation increased substantially to a 25-month high of 11.7% in January 2020 from 6.3% in December 2019, while non-food inflation stood at 2.9%. The change in the CCPI measured on an annual average basis increased marginally to 4.5% in January 2020 from 4.3% in December 2019. Monthly change of CCPI recorded at 1.4% in January 2020 and it was due to the price increases observed in the items of both food and non-food categories. Within the food category, prices of vegetables increased significantly due to supply shortages caused by adverse weather conditions prevailed during the previous month. 
In addition, prices of coconut, red onions and fresh fruits also recorded increases in January 2020. Meanwhile, prices of items in the non-food category recorded an increase during the month owing to price increases of the items in housing, water, electricity, gas and other fuel, housing and education as well as restaurants and hotels subcategories. However, reflecting the downward tax revisions introduced by the government with effect from 1st December 2019, prices of items in health and communication subcategories decreased in January 2020. The core inflation, which reflects the underlying inflation in the economy, decreased to 3% in January 2020 from 4.8% in December 2019 on year-on-year -year basis. Annual average core inflation also decreased to 5.3% in January 2020 from 5.5% in December 2019. Sri Lanka Tea Board announces that the national tea production in the country during the month of December last year decreased by 17% in comparison to the production in December 2018. Sri Lanka Tea Board in a statement also said that the production of all three sectors such as low-grown, high-grown and medium-grown tea sectors have declined in the same month in comparison to 2018. Sri Lanka Tea Board said that the tea production in the month of December 2019 is 21,893,818 kilograms in comparison to over 26 million kilograms in 2018. Thus, it shows a decrease of 4.4 million kilograms, which accounts to 16.8% drop against the corresponding month of 2018. Moreover, the all three sectors such as low-grown, high-grown and medium-grown tea sectors have also declined in December 2019 in comparison to 2018. Meanwhile, cumulative tea production for the last year shows a decrease of 1.25% against the year 2018, along with a production of about 303 million kilograms. Stay tuned for more news after this short break. Welcome back after the break. Advocata policy think tank stresses that recent Sri Lankan Airlines corruption scandal reveals need for deeper structural reform in the state enterprises. In this backdrop, Advocata also provides a series of recommendations to address the issue. The statement from Advocata followed when it was revealed that Airbus paid the wife of a Sri Lankan Airlines executive two million US dollars out of a 16 million US dollars bribe over a large Airbus deal. Following this fraud, President Gotabe Rajapaksa ordered an inquiry over these allegations and while welcoming the President's decision to order investigations, Advocata also urges the government to attend to the deep-rooted issue of systematic misgovernance embedded in Sri Lanka's state-owned enterprises. SOEs such as Sri Lankan Airlines continue to remain some of the largest burdens on Sri Lanka's debt-ridden treasury and Airlines has accumulated a net loss of 17.2 billion rupees solely for the year 2018 and to date. The airline has accumulated losses of 169 billion rupees since nationalization in 2009. Advocata's recent report on the state of state enterprises in Sri Lanka reveals that SOEs are vulnerable to mismanagement and corruption because of political conflicts between the ownership and policy-making functions of the government and undue political influence on their policies, appointments and business practices as evidenced by the recent Sri Lankan Airlines scandal. Meanwhile, in this backdrop, Advocata provides recommendations to address serious problem in procurement. It says the National Procurement Commission should be independent and should enforce their mission of formulating fair, equitable, transparent, competitive and cost-effective policies, procedures and processes for the procurement of goods and services, works, consultancy services and information systems performed by the government institutions in a timely manner. Implementing e-government procurement to address prevailing constraints in Sri Lanka's public procurement marketplace is also another recommendation provided by Advocata. Meanwhile, pertaining to the same issue, Transparency International Sri Lanka highlights the importance of paying compensation to the countries who are the victims of corrupt deals involving Airbus since aircraft manufacturer Airbus reached a record of 3.6 billion euro settlement with US, UK and French authorities following a four-year investigation into allegations of bribery and corruption. 
TISL Executive Director Asoka Obe Sekharas said that given that the evidence now shows that corruption was involved in the procurement process, it is imperative that action is taken both internationally and locally to ensure that Airbus and its agents are held accountable for losses inflicted on Sri Lanka. Obeseker added that the settlement reached between Airbus and prosecuting authorities in the US, UK and France should by no means be interpreted as a clean slate and that the actions of Airbus and its agents as far as Sri Lanka is concerned is emblematic of corrupt and exploitative business practices which prey on the vulnerable. The Export Development Board announces that it has exported nearly 16 billion US dollars of goods and services last year, achieving 87% of the revised target of 18.5 billion US dollars. This was announced at the media briefing held last week. In 2019, we exported 16.1 billion dollars of goods and services from our country, which is a marginal increase year on year. Service exports, which is part of the 16.1 billion dollars, have shown a relatively decent increase year on year of almost 5%, whereas the merchandise exports have shown almost no growth. In 2019, we've achieved 87% of the budget we've set for the year. Sri Lanka's major export markets are the US, almost at $3 billion, UK, just under a $1 billion, India, $759 million, Germany, $646 million, and Italy at half a billion dollars. The main export regions, which is quite important for you all to know, so you understand who our trading partners are. Number one, which is the European bloc, almost at three and a half billion dollars. US followed almost at 3.1 billion dollars, and then South Asia. In, if I look at the statistics in the region, regretfully, we performed very poorly. India has exported 323 billion dollars. Singapore, $441 billion, Vietnam, $242 billion, Thailand, $249 billion. In comparison, Sri Lanka was $16.1 billion. EDB Chairman Prabash Subasinghe also noted that Sri Lanka need to increase its exports in the Asian region, considering the fact that the highest growth rate is recorded in Asia. It has been in discussion now for, for quite a few years. So I'm hoping that we could finish this in the next 12 to 18 months, which China is a very important market for us. So we need preferential trade access. And the ASEAN agreement is something I would like to address. It's not something we have not even started discussion, but that's something we would need in the future for us to grow our exports in Asia. If you see, our biggest trading blocks today are the US and the European Union. But we are not trading actively in Asia. We need to increase our exports in Asia because Asia is where the highest growth is. So for us to do that, we need to plug into the ASEAN agreement. The World Bank reaffirmed its continued support to Sri Lanka's growth and development for the benefit of all its people as World Bank Vice President for South Asia Hartwig Sheffer concluded a four-day visit. Moreover, Hartwig Sheffer also said that technology and innovations will drive Sri Lanka's future growth. During his visit, Hartwig Schaffer gained a better understanding of the country's development priorities under the new government and how the World Bank's financial and knowledge resources can be deployed for maximum impact. Schaffer congratulated President Gotabe Rajapaksa on the recent elections victory and assured the World Bank's continued support to realize Sri Lanka's growth and development aspirations. He also met the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance Mahindra Rajapaksa and senior government officials including the newly appointed Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Professor W.D. Lakshman and the Secretary to the Ministry of Finance, Sajit Artigala. Here, World Bank Vice President for South Asia, Hartwig Schaffer, briefing on the evaluations and projects undertaken during his four-day visit to Sri Lanka. We discussed the World Bank partnership that has been for over six decades with Sri Lanka and how we can take this forward in the next phase to help Sri Lanka mobilize its growth potential and create jobs for its youth. I also had the opportunity to see some of the projects uh, that the World Bank is supporting. Here I am in Kegol. Uh, the World Bank is supporting a state-of-the-art rural water supply system for a number of villages in the province, and particularly here for a village of 240 households serving over a thousand people with clean, potable water, which is so important for the rural areas. 
I also was in Kandy to see how the World Bank will work together with the government to modernize the Kandy multimodal transport terminal that will benefit hundreds of thousands of commuters who are coming every day into this uh, important city in Sri Lanka. The World Bank is committed to continue our support to Sri Lanka to work with all stakeholders, development partners, and the government of Sri Lanka for the people of Sri Lanka. They don't deserve anything less. We will be back after a short break. Welcome back after the break. Emphasizing the challenges on the export sector, the Acting Director General of Commerce, Nimal Karunatilika, explained why Sri Lanka cannot enjoy the GSP Plus facility fully in the apparel industry. He made these observations at the 25th Annual General Meeting of the National Chamber of Exporters held in Colombo recently. We see in the first place our export basket, except I think apparel, all other goods still, majority of them are agro-based. You take tea, rubber, coconut, spices. These are agro-based products and you cannot increase the supply at your wish. It depends on the angular weather conditions and any minute or any year, if the weather is not good with you, you will have a real situation. Apparel, of course, is the largest industry, but we, our value addition could be about maybe 30 to about 40%. And then uh, that's why actually the why, one reason why we can't enjoy the GSP Plus fully is that our apparel, whatever that we export, but half of that cannot meet the rules of origin because we have to depend on imported fabrics. Once we depend on imported fabrics, that disqualifies us under the rules of origin. Not, of course, apparel industry knows this very well, but for the benefit of others, when uh, to export to EU under GSP Plus, the apparel sector should start the production from the yarn stage. So we have some weaving mills. We have been having continuous discussion with the JAF, Joint Apparel Association for Apparel Forum. But it seems that apparel, uh, there's a lot of limitations. We don't have space in the first place to have good apparel, uh, weaving mills or so textile industry. Water is a problem, all kind of issues. Elaborating on the issues related to the export sector, Acting Director General of Commerce Nimal Karnatilaka brought forward the burgeoning issues related to the labour in Sri Lanka. He underscored the stark mismatch of labour prevalent in Sri Lanka. We already know that we have a huge problem with the labour. Skill mismatch is a huge problem. We have people but not suitable for most of the jobs. And in certain areas we don't have adequate people at all. So this is a huge problem. We understand now we are trying to, I think some industries want to import from Nepal, Bangladesh, etc, etc. But I don't know how far this will go. Uh, we heard some time back that our Immigration Act is going to be sort of uh, revised and there are going to be a uh, Human Resources uh, Development Council which will look into the different uh, say, labor requirements in industries and permit like other countries do. But I don't know how long this will take before they are implemented. Now a subject expert at First Capital Holdings will be joining us to bring you the usual analysis on the stock performances. The benchmark ASPI continued its positive momentum from the previous week. However, on Monday, the index remained broadly flat and gained a mere one point, whilst 47% of the day's turnover was concentrated on parcel trades made in banking counters, commercial bank and nation's trust bank. Amidst recording the lowest volumes in over seven months. On Wednesday, the index gained on the price appreciations from the trades made in big cap Ceylon Tobacco and Singer Sri Lanka. Moreover, on Thursday, the index gained through price increases made in Dialogue, Carson's and Brown Investments. Throughout the week, foreign selling continued to dominate on diversified counter John Keyes Holdings and banking counter Commercial Bank. On expectation of company earnings portraying an upturn in most counters, we expect the positive momentum to continue in the market along with moderate activity levels. Nonetheless, foreigners are likely to show selling pressure in the upcoming week as well. We expect the selling pressure to subsidize with the release of company earnings. That's all the news for today. Do not forget to send us your comments, waves and opinions via our email address and our hotline. And also log into our Facebook page to get the latest news and updates. With that, we'll be signing off for this week. See you again on Monday with State of Business. Until then, take care. Good night.